Matias Caraval from CK Research here. I'm here with Bob Liberde from the Cube Research, and we're doing a joint Zcast. And analyst Q, angle. And analyst angle from yeah. Q Research. Yeah, we're here in Paris at Extreme Connect 2025. That's Extreme's user event. Uh, Bob, uh, boy, there's a lot to unpack here, huh? There is a lot. Yeah. There is a lot. It's very different from prior years. Uh, great to see that, um, you know, they've done a lot of the hard work in prior years, building the foundation, pulling things together, universal hardware. And this year, it's really about innovation. In yeah. Software. In fact, it's. Uh, I was talking to their CEO Ed Meyercourt about that, who just celebrated his 10-year anniversary as CEO, yeah. and we were talking about all the stuff they had to do to get to this point. Like you think yeah. about what Extreme is today, it's actually a company made up of a bunch of acquisitions of Brocade's data center business, Avaya's networking business, Motorola's Wi-Fi business, Arrowhive companies like that. Yeah. And so they had all these disparate platforms, and they went through this long process of rationalizing the portfolio. No more purple versus blue versus red, right? Creating a single back end, universal hardware. And it seems like this year is the culmination of that. Correct. Yeah, like I said, all that all that foundational work is done. And now, like I said, I think what was most impressive is some of their announcements around platform yeah. one is there now we're 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 going to see a very rapid acceleration of their innovation cycle. Yeah, so platform one was the big news here. What did you think Correct. of that? So I, I think it's great. I mean, it was it marked a, a significant step forward for where they were. It incorporates a lot of the AI capabilities. They talked on stage today, Marcus and Nabil, about the fact that this is not this is something they've been working on for years yeah. prior to Chat GPT. They've just kept it really quiet and in the skunk works. It's a combination of agentic AI, generative AI, et cetera. And conversational AI. Conversational yeah. AI. So they brought a lot of components into it and they're really looking to accelerate and enable organizations to take advantage of AI and take advantage of autonomy. But one of the really key parts about it was that they ensured that in building it out, they kept the human in the loop. And so for every task that's happening, there's a checkpoint for a human to be able to interact with the software itself and decide whether it wants to move forward with an autonomous action. Yeah, and what I liked about what they showed on stage mm -hmm. was they actually showed real use cases. Yes. Uh, you know, for instance, they had a, a network that was having some performance problems and they were able to troubleshoot that relatively quickly. Um, and what's gonna be interesting to see though is when we talk to the customers here, yeah. some are pretty excited about AI and there's other ones that are like, no, no, we can work better without it. Yeah. I think that's a little bit of old school thinking personally. I think, Correct. in fact, the Microsoft uh, speaker uh, that was here, his advice was, look, the, with AI, there's no fast follower. You do it Correct. or you don't, and if you don't, you're gonna fall behind. And uh, I, I think um, uh, you know, one of the things Extreme did really well was they came up with these different types of agent, service agent, things like that, that actually address problems, but that, right. but I do think they are gonna see a little resistance in their customer bases. They try and figure out how to use it without interrupting their jobs, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's it, that's the, the hard part, right? A company can come up with great technology, but there's still people in process, right? And so a lot of times that people and that cultural aspect is the hardest thing to get over. And I think it's really about organizations you know, I've, I've coined the term the time to comfort with the AI technology. And I think the gentleman from Microsoft was correct. You, you need to get started. Yeah. The key is it's not, it's not binary. It doesn't mean when you get started with AI or using AI, it means you're going full self-driving mode right out of the gate. Yeah. These organizations need to get used to the technology. They need to get used to what the software is telling them. They need to get acclimated to it. They need to validate that what it's saying is true by doing their own investigation and so forth. That's going to take time. But if you don't get started, then absolutely, you're going to get left behind as other organizations are able to go through and identify those tasks, which can be quickly automated. And then they're going to be the ones spending more time on strategic initiatives and not doing manual routine tasks. Yeah, and it's going to, you know, I think one of the things I like about it is some of the more leading customers are already thinking about how to take advantage of it. You know, I was talking with Fareed Farouk, who runs the <coughs> Dubai World Trade Center, and he was saying that, you know, they tear up and tear down networks very, almost in real time. But he said the way the fabric works, and I want to talk about that later, yeah. you don't have a lot of visibility into it. And so with 
from a capacity planning perspective, they can actually create a digital twin of an event this year, and the next year run some what-if scenarios. What if there's 10% more traffic? What if there's 20% more devices? And then figure out where the network's gonna break before <clears throat> they do the event, cool. and then that, and thereby come up with a network that just, you right. know, They can reallocate yeah, the network yeah. AP positions and so forth to accommodate the additional traffic or yeah. additional throughput, whatever's, whether it's coverage or throughput, right? They're able to make those and proactively. The, yeah, and that is something you couldn't do before. Right? Correct. And so on the topic of fabric, you and I have come to a lot of connects. We have. Right? And um, I don't know if I've heard the word fabric used <clears throat> as in, in total, in aggregate, from all the previous connects, as I've heard it used here yeah. uh, this year. And uh, um, I'm not sure what's changed or why, but it seems like fabric is now, and maybe it's the visibility on top of it that allows them to do more with it, but it seems like fabric's really hitting its stride, although I still don't think the general world understands the difference between the <clears throat> SPB-based Layer 2 fabric and what everybody else has at Layer 3. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I think there's some, there's some education that needs to be done, but I think some of the things that I was impressed with, with what I heard this week were organizations that were talking about the fact that they've been able to really scale their fabric up to very large sizes, and the other thing is that they've been able to extend it from just a data center and campus play, but also to the edge. And so as we think about modern environments, right, the applications, et cetera, highly distributed, you've got network gear everywhere, right, it's really needed to enable. So the fact that you're able to potentially extend that fabric across your entire environment will certainly simplify the management, the configuration, uh, and, and overall just optimization of the network. And frankly, you know, you and I cover Extreme pretty closely. <clears throat> I had no idea they actually solved that problem because Correct. the big issue with the Layer 2 fabric is once it gets too big, the broadcast storms become too big, Correct. and uh, it, it doesn't really scale past about 500 devices. And now they seem like they, they put in something called area yeah. fabric or something, which allows them to actually go campus-wide. And so that's a... If they can do that, I mean, that really is a, a, a big advantage for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, one of the best kept secrets, right, is that yeah. they've been able to do this. But I think it's going to, like, again, because of the increased complexity, the distributed nature, being able to extend the fabric, I think, is going to be key for organizations who need to stay agile, like you were saying, spinning up networks, right, multiple times, even during a day, on a daily basis, potentially, even. So. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in fact, some of the cases they talked about on stage where I think one of the UK customers has had in 10 years of running it or 15 years, they've had, uh, I think, one hour of downtime or something like that. Yeah, like one outage, yeah. Yeah, yeah one outage, and so that's, uh, uh, I mean, that I guess that speaks for itself, so. Yeah, it's a testament yeah. to, the, to the technology, right, to the hardware that they've built and so forth. And again, the interesting piece is mm -hmm. that up until now, it's usually all these conversations have been about hardware. Now, they did move to the cloud, XIQ, yeah. things like that. They've had a cloud presence, mm -hmm. but this, this show really marks a shift in, like I said, the foundation is all there, the technology is there, the fabric is there. Now we're going to provide those, those capabilities, the software management tools, the artificial intelligence and so forth to really help organizations, I think, drive much better business outcomes. Yeah, now uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens from here. Um, I do, and the company is in an interesting spot because they're a relatively small company, 5% share, in a, in a market with a lot of, not just one 800 pound, pound gorillas, but two, and then yeah. you know another, say, 400 pound gorilla, right? And so typically I would say being able to um, gain share, uh, incredibly difficult. However, in fact, you and I ran a survey last year, Correct. and we asked the question, if a vendor can demonstrate um, better AI capabilities, are you willing to switch? Yep. And uh, I can't, it was over 90%. 97%. Percent said yeah. they would, right? Which is, I've never <clears throat> seen a number like that before in networking, right? right? So people get comfortable with their networking vendors. Yeah. So I, I, I'm a big believer that share shift happens when markets transition. And this moment of AI adoption and, you know, it about to scale might be the thing Extreme has needed to be able to grow their share. Right, absolutely. They yeah. need to be disruptive. And they're bringing something to market, which is going to enable them to be be very disruptive. And it's going to be a combination of the Platform One software capabilities, the universal hardware, and the fabric. So they've got, they're, they're armed to bear, 
with technology and solutions. And I think now it's just really about making the end users and the customers aware of what those outcomes are going to be. And I think that's what we've heard them say is that's going to be their focus about how they go about educating organizations on why they're winning, why the extreme combination of hardware and software is actually providing significant benefit to organizations. Yeah, to me, the, the <clears throat> technology is not their problem right now. The limiting factor is going to be channel, and I think they've got yeah. a pretty good plan to, uh, obviously, so much the channel is tied up in a couple of vendors, but yeah. I, I think they, they seem to have a pretty good plan of being able to uh, disrupt the channel at the edge, at the margin, find those channel partners that are perhaps unhappy with the incumbent they're working with, grab them, and then grow it from there. Yeah, right, and then, but that's I mean, whew, that's no easy task either. No, it's not. I mean, yeah. they've certainly got their their work cut out for them. Uh, we've heard how they have a, a kit that they send around yeah. called the, a called a Bob kit. Yeah, <laughs> uh, no no association with myself, uh, <laughs> but they were able to be able to leverage that to send it out and just being able to do those demos to educate people on what they have along the fabric and the platform, etc. And it's been highly effective for them. So that's where then the channel comes in. If yeah. they can distribute that, get the channel educated, certified on this, be able to, again, go in and show how they can disrupt the status quo and deliver real value. I think they've got a, they've got a great opportunity to significantly increase their market size, but clearly they've got, they have work to do, but they seem determined to, uh, to be able to go out and do it. Yeah, uh, good. So overall positive experience. Yeah, I would say yeah. overall positive experience and really excited to see, you know, the, the Platform One announcements and the ability to show the real software running on a live environment has been super positive. And what we've seen from their roadmap, we're going to see an accelerated pace of innovation coming out from them. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I guess I'll wrap this up to, for a final thought for myself and I'll like to hear yeah. from you. I, I think Extreme, in fact, Drew Crisp from uh, Liverpool said this uh, on stage this morning, that... Nobody handles tough environments better than extreme. And you yeah. think of, and one of the reasons why I like their sports partnerships, they're in Fenway Park, they're in Dodger Stadium, they're in uh, Wrigley Field, um, you know, they're, they're in Liverpool, Manchester. All these stadiums, when they were built, were not designed for Wi-Fi or for networking, right? Correct. And uh, extreme, however they've done it, they have figured out how to make networks operate in really tough environments. And that extends to you know, warehouses, things like that. And I think if they, you know, people talk about, you know, your superpower is, their superpower is that. And, and, I, and I think that's a, uh, a trait that they have that probably flies under the radar. Yeah, no, I would agree with you. And in fact, we, we heard a lot of the messaging this week was, we go to extremes yeah. for you. And I think that was really evident in a lot of the customer case stories when they got up and talked about we had this very difficult environment. They were there side by side helping us solve this problem, helping us fix it. Other, other organizations couldn't. So the fact that they're willing to go that extra mile to help organizations get a much better outcome. And they also have a lot of experience with all these now. So they're, they're much better suited to help those organizations who have these issues to get over them much faster. As well. Yeah, in fact, when they started winning sports deals over here, I remember talking about that they initially wouldn't let their UK partners do the deals. They brought over the American partners that had done the those deal. difficult environments before, taught them the process to go through before they allowed them to scale that. And I think they were very, very careful to make sure that each customer has been successful. And um, yeah. you know that you can do that as a billion dollar company. So again, that yeah. level of customer intimacy, intimacy, we'll see if they can scale that. But all, you know, all, all signs are positive now. So. I would say so. Yes, yeah. sir. All right. So uh, on behalf of Bob Lurde from the Cube Research and an analyst angle. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Zia Caraval from ZK Reach. Thanks for watching the Zcast. Um, give us a like and hit that subscribe button in both cases. In both cases. Yeah. And we'll see you next time on another Zcast and an analyst angle. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.